Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have set apart this day as a day of remembrance, to remember you and your creation, as well as being a reminder of how you can recreate us in your likeness, in your image. It's also a reminder of the time to come when you will recreate this world and make it new again. Lord, we want to be a part of that. We want to be part of your family, and we want to understand your word is spoken through your prophet John today. So meet with us and send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds as we study the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still in the first chapter of the wonderful book of Revelation, a word that means revealing or unveiling or taking the cover off. And it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I know some Bibles say revelation of St. John, but uh, the first verse tells us it's the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It contains a lot of word pictures that we will be unpackaging as we go. The Bible is its own best glossary or dictionary and gives us enough, enough information so that we can decipher, decode the symbols that are used. So we are now down to, uh, we're looking at verses 4 and onward. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, we're going to find that these were the, the book was particularly addressed to seven churches that were in Asia, to the north of where John was on the island of Patmos, uh, and there were specific parts that we'll get into when we study chapter two and chapter three, special messages to each one of those churches. So that'll be exciting as we get into that part of it. And then he says, "Grace to you and peace." Grace, of course, is God's gift. Peace is what the result of that is when we receive it. Grace to you and peace from him who was, who, who is, and was, and is to come. And we found that that's an expression of God's eternal nature. It's rooted back in Exodus 3, 14, where the Lord met Moses and said, I am, that is the name that you will use when you tell the people that I have sent you. And it's expressive of the fact that God has always been. Our minds cannot fully appreciate what that means. We cannot conceive of eternity that way or that way. And yet the Bible tells us that God is, was, and is to come. And Jesus, when he was here, uh, claimed that title, didn't he? You remember in John chapter 8, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And there was no doubt in the minds of his audience what he was saying. He was saying, I am Yahweh, which is the name of God that expresses that idea, coming from the verb to be, he said, I, I am the one that spoke with Moses. I am the one that you've been reading about in the Old Testament. So in this particular context, we believe that that is referring to God the Father, just because of the way the, the, uh, the grammar is expressed there. But just keep in mind that all of the attributes of deity apply equally to all members of the Godhead. So what it says here could be applied legitimately to God the Son or God the Spirit. They share the attributes of divinity equally. The only difference is that now, because Jesus became a part of the human family, he has voluntarily given up the omnipresence aspect of it. So we're looking here, and I'm looking at the uh, top of page three on your outline. We're looking at the sets of three. We find that in the book of Revelation particularly, it's throughout the, all of the Bible, but particularly in the book of Revelation, there's emphasis on numbers. And the number three is a special number. It reminds us of the Godhead. And we're gonna find that there are recurrences of the number three or thing, things that are organized in sets of three many times. Another number, of course, that's featured is the number seven. And we'll counter that many, many times. I can't remember exactly now how, how many, but something like 45 times the number seven is mentioned in the book of, of Revelation. So where do, where do we see the three there? We see the Father as being the one who is, was, and is to come. And then it says, from the seven spirits who are before the throne. So that's referring to the Holy Spirit. The number seven there is, again, just an expressive of completeness and perfection. And verse 5, from Jesus Christ. So we have the three members of the Godhead expressed in those, in those uh, phrases there. God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. So we're looking now at another set of three, a set of three within the set of three. Within 
the, the third part of that set of three referred to Jesus, we have some more sets of three. And we have actually two of those. We have titles in a com combination of three that refer to Jesus. And then we have activities that also refer to Jesus. So the three titles that we see there, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. And again, uh, if you, I remind you that uh, the words of the New Testament and the Old Testament are available to you through the wonderful app called Blue Letter Bible. And if you look on that, just to review real quickly, if you go to your app, tap on the app, and then it'll give you some options there as far as Old or New Testament. So we're gonna tap on New Testament. We're gonna go down to Revelation and tap on that. We're gonna to go to chapter one, and we are going to verse five, and we tap on verse five. Now we see the uh, options there. The very top one is interlinear or concordance. We're gonna tap on that. And here now we see the actual uh, text as it was printed in the original language, but that's okay, because down a little further, you have the interlinear part that shows it in the original language as well as the English side by side. So it's easy to follow. So we see the text there. It says, and from Jesus Christ, and then you see the word witness there. And what is the English spelling or the English pronunciation for the word witness there? Our word martyr comes from that, exactly. And Jesus is the faithful martyr. Martyr means one who gives a testimony. It's more specific in our language because we think of it as one who gives their testimony by their blood, by their life. And Jesus did that. So he is the faithful martyr in the, uh, in the true sense of it. So that's a title. He is the witness. And then the next one, it says, the firstborn from the dead. So let's think about that a little bit. And you look at the word there, if you see it on your Blue Letter Bible, uh, we pronounce that if you want to uh, pronounce it, it would be prototokos. And it's a combination word, a compound word. Uh, the protos is, uh, means first. And we have words in our language that bear that out. Prototokos. Uh, proto, a prototype, you know what that means. That's the, 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 the one that is made first and then copies can be made from that. So proto uh, means first and uh, the last part of it has to do with birth. So the word firstborn is a, is a legitimate translation of that, but we need to think about it for just a minute because uh, in the way that the language um, grew, and it was used over the process of time, uh, certain nuances, certain applications were made of words that were not part of the original understanding. The original understanding was first to be born, the one who was born first. Now, back then, that put you in a position of honor, uh, and you were going to be the one that would be the heir of the family and receive the double portion, the first to be born. But then we find that that word is used in the Bible, and we'll look at some texts here. We find that that word used, was used in the Bible to refer not necessarily to first in the sense of chronology, but first in the sense of importance or preeminence. So if you have your Bible there, uh, let's look at a couple of texts. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22. We're asking ourselves, what does it mean when it says that Jesus was the firstborn, firstborn from the dead? What does that actually mean? So in Exodus 4, we're going to see the word used here. Exodus 4, verse 22. And this is what Moses was commissioned to tell the king of Egypt. He said, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my what? My firstborn. Now, Israel was a name that was given to someone else who, whose original name was Jacob. Jacob. That's right. Jacob was uh, a son of, of Isaac. And uh, what happened in, in that story, if you remember, was that ultimately uh, Jacob was the one that, that, that the Lord used. Jacob was the one that was the one who was to convey, to transmit the covenant blessings. And even though he was not the first to be born, he was looked upon as the firstborn 
because God established him in, him in that in that position. Even though he wasn't the first, who was the first to be born? Esau. He was the first to be born, but his brother Jacob was the firstborn. Now that sounds confusing, but it's not really if you understand that the term firstborn came to mean the one who holds the position of preeminence and importance. And that applied to Jacob, and it also applied to David. If you look in the 89th Psalm, Psalm 89, by the way, while you're returning to that, how many brothers did David have? A lot, somebody says. You're right. He had seven brothers. He was the eighth brother. You remember when Samuel came to anoint the new king, Eliab was the first to be born. He was the oldest. And Samuel thought, he's the one. Why look at him? Look at how, how uh, handsome he is and how tall, how noble looking. But the Lord said, no, he's not the one. Man looks on the outside appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. They went through all seven that Jesse brought before him. And the Lord said to Samuel, no, 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 no. And then finally, when they came to the end, uh, Samuel was confused. He said, uh, do you have any more sons? Well, yes, but it's, he's just the shepherd boy out there. We'll bring him. And the Lord said, he's the one. So Eliab, in the family of Jesse, Eliab was the first to be born. But David was the firstborn. Okay, Psalm 89, verse 27. I will make him... The highest, make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Speaking about my servant David, you go back to verse 20, you see it there. So we have a number of references. We have them on the page here, and we can look them up, starting with Colossians 1.18. We have a number of references where Jesus is given the title firstborn. And he was the first to be born of Mary. That was Mary's first birth experience, wasn't it? Uh, but uh, in a wider sense, Christ is the first, firstborn in the sense of preeminence. So Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, speaking of Jesus, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And that's the key thought of what the term firstborn means in the, in the Bible um, nuance, you know, the Bible uh, culture of language there. The one who has the preeminence. So just keep that in mind when uh, discussion comes up about Christ being the firstborn. It doesn't necessarily, it can mean first to be born, but uh, it certainly isn't limited to that. It also has the application that we see rooted actually in the Bible that it, uh, we can refer to a person who has received preeminence or a position of importance who was not the first to be born, but was given the status of firstborn. Uh, Hebrews 1.6, notice that we've seen now twice that it's called, it attaches the idea firstborn from the dead. So we'll, we'll give that thought in, in just a second. But in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter one is Paul's discourse on the divinity of Jesus. Uh, the book of Hebrews is about Christ, and, and Paul is doing his best to share with his, the friends of his Jewish background the fact that Jesus is the true Messiah and that he is God in the flesh. And so the first chapter of Hebrews, Paul quotes from the scriptures, the Old Testament, showing that uh, this one who was, was uh, born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth and was the humble Galilean teacher was actually the sovereign God, was actually the creator God. So in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, it reads, uh, you know, Paul's developing his argument there, showing how that Jesus is superior to the angels and that in fact he is God. We're looking at verse 6, Hebrews 1. He brought the firstborn into the world and said, let all the angels of God worship him. Now in the Bible, we're told very specifically that there's only one being that we should appropriately worship, and that is God. So if the scriptures tell us, and Paul is applying uh, it to Christ and saying that the angels of God should worship him, that is Jesus, and that tells us very clearly that Jesus is worthy of worship and he must be a member of the Godhead. But he's again called the firstborn uh, in this text, the prototokos. Obviously he wasn't the first, he, first to be born, that would be Cain in the literal sense. 
but in the sense of being the preeminent one. And again, the firstborn from the dead, as we'll take a look at that. Jesus is first. In preeminence, not necessarily chronology. Now, when we think about firstborn from the dead, we're thinking about the resurrection of Christ on that, on that Sunday morning, right? Died on Friday, rested in the grave on the Sabbath, resurrected Sunday morning. And because of that, he's given the title, the firstborn from the dead. But was he the first to be resurrected to immortality? No, how do we know that? Moses, exactly. So we have the text there, Romans 5:14. And in Romans 5.14, it says that death reigned from Adam to Moses. And it's giving us the, the idea that, that death was unchallenged. Death was unconquerable, invincible from Adam on up until Moses. And what do we know about Moses? We know that he died. The Bible describes that he died and was buried before the children of Israel went into the promised land. But we also know that he must have been brought back to life. Because there he is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Luke chapter 9 gives us the story, verse 30. And Moses is there along with Elijah. And they are representatives of the two classes, those that pass away in death but will be resurrected, and those that do not taste death will be translated alive when Jesus comes back. So Moses and Elijah are there, and the Mount of Transfiguration story is before the cross and resurrection, obviously. So Moses must have been resurrected, we say to glory, that means to an immortal existence, to a body that would not decay and die. And uh, uh, Moses' resurrection was certainly prior to uh, Jesus' resurrection. So it's, again, firstborn in the idea of not necessarily chronology, but in importance, because if Christ had not been raised from the dead, then the story of salvation is ended. Right? What does Paul say in, in 1 Corinthians 15? If Jesus is not raised, we are still, still in our sins and without hope. So Christ's resurrection was the most important resurrection that could ever, ever, ever take place. Moses' resurrection was important. That was nice. It was a token of what God is going to do. I appreciate the fact that Sister White says it was not long between the time that he died and was buried and brought back to life. Uh, but nevertheless, even though he was the first to be resurrected, he wasn't the preeminent one. Christ was. Yeah, Daisy, did your hand have your hand up? Okay, remember to speak directly into it, and I'm going to have to try to repeat your your thought. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Daisy. What Daisy is saying is that uh, beside the term uh, firstborn, there's the term in the Bible, first fruits. And in 1 Corinthians 15, again, it describes very clearly that Christ is the first fruits. Uh, uh, and that was, again, was a token of thanksgiving and uh, uh, an expression of God's power and so on. But even though he was the first fruits, as we're seeing, he was, not the, the, he was not the first to be resurrected, but he was first in priority or first in preeminence. And that's what the term, we use the word first in that sense today, don't we? If I talk to you today about the first lady, you're not thinking I'm talking about Eve. I don't think. You know I'm talking about the wife of the president. We call her the first lady. She's not the first lady, but she's the first lady, if you see the difference. Brother Don, please. Take a note. Uh, oftentimes, you know, people uh, take the text out of context. And uh, the read uh, Lord uh, Lamy is born of for and of heaven, heaven, not in heaven. And the reason I had a conversation with someone, he was trying to misinterpret that text so that we have to be very careful with reading the careful in the text, not taking it out of context either. Thank you, Don. We're having a little trouble with our internet, so for the sake of our online audience, give me a second to see if I can bring that back. I don't know what the trouble is today that we're having trouble. I would apologize to our online audience, but I can't. <laughs> 
anyway, we'll uh, keep trying. Yes, thank you for that comment, Don. Um, Christ was born of, he born of heaven, but not in heaven. The Bible, you know, when you, when you understand the Bible, when you study the Bible, the, the purpose is to uh, put the pieces together in the way that makes it harmonious. And you'll find a text over here, a text over there that might seem to turn, might seem to point in a different direction. But the, the, the objective of studying the Bible is to put the pieces in a way where they all match on all sides. And the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is an eternal member of the Godhead from the days of eternity, Micah 5, 2, and so on. So other texts that use terms that at first glance may, may seem like, like he was, had a beginning or he was a created being in that sense, we have to come to find a way to understand those by legitimate study, not by forcing something, but by legitimate study, find a way to understand it that brings harmony to, to the scriptures. And we can do it. It's all, all together possible. Even Proverbs 8, uh, understood in the right way, supports the divinity of Jesus. Uh, but Sister Judy, I think it is. is that? I was looking at Psalm 89, which says, I have found David, my servant, in verse 20, with my holy oil, I anointed him. Now, David was not the firstborn of all the sons of Jesse. He was the, the last one, I believe. Right. However, down in verse um, 20, is it 27? Thank you. It says, also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. And that's just another example. Yes. Oh, they already said that. I'm yeah. sorry. That's a... It's good to be reminded, though. No, 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 no need for apology. Yeah, that's a beautiful text. Thank you, Judy. So um, we're thinking of the term firstborn, and we're coming to understand that it means many times one in preeminence, not necessarily the first to be born or the first to be resurrected, but the one whose resurrection uh, is of the highest preeminence. Uh, OK, going down there, just this, you know, I throw into the notes here things that uh, demonstrate how English comes from the language of the New Testament, just, just for interest. It's what you see when you're looking through your Blue Letter Bible. Uh, when it says the firstborn from the dead, uh, the word dead in, in their language is necros, and that comes into our English language. Uh, anybody in the medical field knows what necro necrotic means, necrotic tissue or whatever. So we have a lot of words that come into our language. Another one is the word kings, and uh, you'll see that the... Uh, the word there is uh, basilefs, and that word comes into our language, a, uh, what would you say, a royal dwelling for a uh, church leader is a basilica. Have you ever heard the word basilica? Basilica comes from this word, and it just means royal dwelling. And there's something else that comes from that word. If you're in the kitchen a lot, you might use a herb that has a royal flavor to it. It is basil. basil. The name basil comes from this same word. He's royal or kingly. So Jesus is the one who is the firstborn from the dead and the uh, ruler over the kings of the earth. He is the one that legitimately is the king of kings. Now in the Bible, there were those who were kings who ruled over kings. Nebuchadnezzar, for example, he was a king of kings. But there's only one that can accurately and uh, um, truly be called the king of kings, and that's Jesus. Men have struggled through the centuries to come to this understanding, and Nebuchadnezzar himself had quite a journey, didn't he, to come to that and to know that it is the most high that rules in the heavens, and he puts up one and puts down another. But he eventually came uh, to that understanding. His grandson, Belshazzar, never came to it. But to know that Jesus rules, even though the devil has a lot of leash today, a lot of latitude, God is still in control. And even though our world seems like it's on a course toward oblivion with the things that are going on in our world, God is still on the throne. That's the message of Ezekiel 1. In Ezekiel's life, it looks like the world had turned upside down. There's their beloved city, their temple, and now the enemy has come in and wreaked havoc. And how do you make sense about this? What happened? Where is God? And yet the vision that, he came, that came to him in Ezekiel 1 showed that amidst all the confusing things represented by the wheels within wheels, it seems so perplexing, nevertheless, on top, 
There was one on the throne. So we must keep that in mind. God still rules in the kingdom of men. Now, someday we believe soon that that uh, demonstration of his rulership will be made evident that will bring the earthly kingdoms to their end. The statue of Daniel 2 will be smitten by the stone. And we look forward to that, don't we? Because this life is just on a downward course, a spiral toward uh, anarchy and other things. But Jesus is the ruler. Well, another word there I just threw in, it's the word earth, and it's, it's the word gi, and we have that in so many, you know, geology, geography, anything that begins with that comes from that root. So we have three, um, three titles that pertain to Christ. He's the, uh, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Then we have, following that, another set of three. And these describe three activities that uh, Jesus is involved in intimately. And what are those? It says, he who loved us, washed us, and made us, made us kings and priests. So let's spend a minute on, uh, on those three uh, indicators of redemptive activity. To him who loved us. We shouldn't rush over that word, should we? We should spend just a minute about it. Now, um, you'll see down below there, I put, uh, uh, again, whenever I put BLB, that's just a reference that, you know, you can find this information on the Blue Letter Bible and other places too. But in the language that was available to John uh, back there at the close of the first century, there were a lot of words that we would translate with the word love. But they had different, slight different uh, nuances to them. Uh, I've seen many different lists of them. I put down six that fit into that category, but some say there's seven or even eight. But let's just take a look at some of these other words there. There's a word in their language that uh, uh, is philia, and we get a host of words in our language that have P-H-I-L. Philosophy, uh, just go, go down, the down the list. Philodendron, what's a philodendron? That's a plant that loves a tree, loves to climb a tree. Philodendron. Uh, philharmonic, you know, uh, it just goes on and on. Phil, what does Philip mean? Anybody know what Philip means? Lover of or friend of? Horses. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> yes. So Phil is a, is a word for love in their language, but it expresses love in a more uh, emotional friendship sense. It's more like a barter system. If you be nice to me, I'll be nice to you. But if you cross me, look out, you know. Uh, so is that, now can, can there be a, a, a type of friendship love that is appropriate for Christians to engage in? Yes, of course. But uh, uh, it's not the preeminent love that the Bible describes. So there's philia, friendship love. There's ludus, which is playful love, teasing, flirting. You know, Isaac told everybody that he went, when he went down to Egypt that, uh, Rebecca's my sister. And then it describes in the Bible that Isaac and Rebecca were conducting themselves in a way that made, made it plain that they weren't brother and sister. Well, that would be Ludus love. What, do we get an English word from that? Yes, we do. You know what it is? Ludicrous. Ludicrous comes from that word. Playful love, ludicrous. Now we have the next one, philoftia, self-love. Now, at first glance, you'd say, well, that's, uh, we don't want to have anything to do with that. That's wickedness. Well, yes, self-love uh, is certainly something that, that uh, we need to be on guard. But is there a sense in which we need to love ourselves? Is there a sense? Yes, there is. Jesus said, love your neighbor as He didn't say love your neighbor and not yourself. He could have said that, but he didn't. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So in the Bible, it's love to God love to others, and then, yes. Love in the sense of self-esteem in the proper sense. Love in the sense that I recognize that God made me. I just didn't come from an evolutionary cycle of mud, tadpole, monkey, or whatever. No. Uh, God made something very special when he made the human race, and I'm a part of that, and I'm important to God. I'm so important to God, not to take this in a flattery way or whatever, I'm so important to God that he died for me. So we need to have a godly self-esteem. We need to appreciate what God has done for us, not in a selfish way where we, where we ignore God's 
God's presence in our life, but to, to see ourselves in the light of Calvary is an important thing. Sister Yarka, please. It's a reminder, yeah, yes, we need to surrender ourselves every morning to our Lord, but it's so painful when somebody says, oh, I'm stupid, or you know, that, that word, Jesus died for us, and we are so precious. We are, we are apple, uh, uh, how, how is it? Apple of the eye. Apple of the eye, apple yeah. eyes, you know. So it's not just to say some kind of bad words about ourselves. That's very true, Yarka. Yes, uh, bring, bring the microphone up there, and I'll, I'll just make a comment to uh, what Sister Yarka is saying is that uh, a part of, of um, recognizing and appreciating what God has done is to refrain from putting down ourselves or he, other human beings and how damaging it is for a child to hear words from their parents or others saying, you're no good, you'll never amount to anything. That's very, very damaging and uh, words we should never say. Uh, we should appreciate what God has done. Recognizing that we are sinners, we are in need of God's grace, but there's an infinite value placed on every human life. And so in that sense, there can be a form of self-love if you want to think of it that way. Okay, uh, Cindy had a comment, please. There's a human concept that I learned years ago, and it says that unless we feel good about ourselves, we are incapable or it's impossible to feel good about others. And so it's kind of neat to see it in the biblical sense, and that it does come from the Bible, and if we have that healthy self-love, then we are able to show love to other people. And if we don't have that, we're pretty incapable of doing showing love to other people. Right. We have nothing to give. I'm, I'm not sure I need to repeat things because we're apparently not online right now. But uh, was there another comment? Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, God is so loved that he gave the Ten Commandments to us out of his love, the Ten Loving Commandments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have uh, ludus, playful love, philoptia, self-love, storge, family love. There's a particular, the Bible uh, acknowledges mother's love and paternal love. And uh, God is the one who planted those, those uh, feelings within the hearts of, of uh, parents. And, and mothers, fathers will sacrifice for their children, even to the point of giving their own lives, won't they? Won't they? So that's storge, another kind of love. Now, how about this next one? Do we get an English word from that? Yeah, you see it right there, don't you? Obsessive, crazy love, mania. But then we come to the one that the Bible highlights in reference to God's love, and that's, uh, we say agape. The verb is agapao, but the, we, we use the word agape. And that, that word actually was rarely used because it was thought to be too unattainable. It was in the, you know, the words of the poets or, or the thoughts of the philosophers, but the idea that it could actually be seen in, in human flesh, it was thought impossible. But then when Jesus came, the authors of the New Testament said, you've heard about this love that you thought didn't exist? Here it is. That's really the message of the Bible. This love that you thought could not be lived out, could not be manifested, here it is. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. His love is unconditional and eternal. Now God's blessings are conditioned on our relationship to him, our obedience, but his love is not conditional. And his love is what brought him to Calvary. And you could see it in the light that it was as if Jesus was saying, you can whip me, you can put a crown of thorns on my head, you can nail my hands and my feet to a cross, but I'm gonna still love you. And that was expressed in his, his, one of his final prayers, Father, forgive them. These people that have abused me and mistreated me don't appreciate why I'm here. Forgive them, that's God's love, that's agape. It doesn't require a payback, it exists independent of any remuneration in that sense. And God wants to put that kind of love in our hearts. We're not born with it. We're born selfish. We're born with some of these others. Now there's another one that I see that I didn't put down and I actually intended to put down, but I forgot to. And that's uh, uh, eros, E-R-O-S, love on the physical level. And we get the word erotic from that. Now all these other words can be expressive of love that Christians should not be, have, have in their life. 
you know, self-love and, and these other things. But on the other hand, you can see it. it. Isn't God the one that made us the physical beings that we are and said be fruitful and multiply? Yes. So there is a sense in which physical love is appropriate, but it's confined by, by God's instructions to within the, the bonds of marriage between one man and one woman. That's where it is safely, um, uh, uh, safely experienced. Okay, to him who loved us. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. The story of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sin, they run away, but God goes in search of them. That's God's love. He loved us and he washed us. He washed us and made us kings and priests. So we have another set of three that we're talking about here, and these are all having to do with redemptive activities that Jesus is involved in, along with the rest of the members of the Godhead, of course. But loved, washed, and uh, commissioned, you might say, made us kings and priests. So I see this set of three as being illustrated in the sanctuary. You know, the sanctuary is such a wonderful textbook to understand God's word. Thy way, O oh Lord, is in the sanctuary. So when you entered the sanctuary, when you entered the, the curtain, the, the courtyard, what was the very first thing that you encountered? It was the altar, the altar of burnt offering. And that altar of burnt offering where the sacrifice was made was a symbol or was an arrow pointing forward to the cross, right? That's when Jesus offered himself. So you come to the altar first, and then what came next? The labor. So you can see this sequence that we're reading about in Revelation here, to him who loved us, that's Calvary. That's the altar of burnt offering. And washed us, that's the labor. And from there you want, went into the holy place where you had the bread, the light, and the incense that uh, are all part of your Christian journey as well. So very interesting how this is put together. The one who loved us and watched. God is too kind and merciful to leave us alone in our despicable, sinful condition. Now, he accepts us as we are. The Bible tells us that very clearly. The prodigal came back. He didn't look very good. He didn't smell very good, but he was accepted. But God doesn't just leave us smelling like the pigsty. He wants to clean us up and make us useful. So you have the altar, and then you have the labor that expresses God's intention to actually change us. So in the, uh, in the altar, we see justification. And in the labor, we can see how God cleaning us up uh, is in the process of sanctification to make us ready to, to be of service. Now that's expressed many different ways in the Bible. It's expressed in the idea of washing, and we have a number of texts that uh, bring that out. We have Ephesians 5, 26, if you want to look that up real quickly. Time is running out. Ephesians 5 and verse 26 says, well, we'll go back to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So there we have the love part. Christ who loved us, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So you have the concept of the labor uh, in that. He loved us and now he has cleansed us. And that is sometimes in the Bible expressed as water would be washing clothes. And that's a motif that carries all the way through the, you know, the text in Isaiah where it says all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. So uh, the idea of washing our clothes, you have Revelation talks about washing our clothes as well. And that's just, that is expressive of how God wants to work in our life to change us so that we can be like Christ. Not that we can parade our piety, not that we can bo be boastful about how good Christians we are, no. So that we can live to, for the Lord in humility and let his glory shine through us. So it's, it's used in the motif of, of washing, but it's also used in the, in the motif of purifying metal and uh, we know how that's done. It goes all the way back to ancient times where you heat up the metal in the furnace and it separates the impurities, the dross, from the pure metal. And what's the purpose of that? The purpose is, uh, in one way, so that when the refiner looks into the, into the uh, surface that now has been, the dross has been removed, he can see a reflection of himself. 
And that's, there's a deep spiritual lesson in that. So purifying the metal, the process is heat. Not a pleasant thing to think about in terms of what it means in the Christian life, but a necessary one. And Sister White describes this. She says, she talks about how the refiner is the one who controls the temperature and what's happening and does not let things exceed what, uh, what is absolutely necessary. Beautiful thought. So purifying metal, pruning vines, that's another motif that the Bible uses so that we can become more fruitful. And all this is part of God's plan. Polishing the stones. Then it says that we, the washing of the water, we should, let me pause on that for just a second here. Washing of the water by the word. I had a teacher in my college experience that I really, really appreciated, Dr. Leslie Harding. And uh, I learned so much through his uh, presentations. But he used this illustration. You know, he says some people uh, get discouraged about reading the Bible because they say, you know, I read the Bible, I read the Bible, but I can't remember what I read. I won't ask for a show of hands. Maybe there's somebody here that <laughs> wonder about that too. Uh, I get frustrated because I read and what did I, I forgot it. Anyway, uh, the point that Dr. Harding was making in this, in this uh, particular uh, illustration was that when you put your clothes into the washer, the water does its work. It cleanses the clothes. But part of that process is that it happens that the water leaves, but the, so, the clothes are still clean. So by reading the Bible, that water is cleansing as you go. It may be that you won't remember every Bible verse, unless you've got a really retentive mind. But, it, but the water has done its work, and it's washing you clean through the process of cleansing. I, I really appreciated that thought. OK. Uh, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the one who has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The Bible expresses this cleansing operation as being washing by water. And baptism is a symbol of that, of course, in the verse that we just read in Ephesians. But also washing by blood. Now, that one does not make sense in the physical realm, does it? And yet it does in the spiritual sense. What does it mean? It means that when we contemplate, what does the blood stand for in, the, in Bible symbolism? The life is in the blood, right? The blood represents the fact that God came to this earth and was willing to die for us. The more we contemplate on that, the more we begin to learn and appreciate God and his plan and his, his love for us, and it changes us. Sister White says we should spend a thoughtful hour thinking about the events of Calvary because it's going to be washing us by the blood. As we think about what God has done for us by Jesus coming to this earth and dying for our sins, uh, it changes us, brings us closer to him. So we're washed by the blood. You love that song, Power in the Blood? That's a great song. I love that song. Power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. And then the third part of that is it made us kings and priests to his God and Father. And again, the Lord has plans for us in the future life, and even now, but especially if we think about the future life, that we cannot now completely appreciate. But Jesus said, you're going to sit with me on my throne. You're going to be occupying a position of rulership and dominion. To the one who was faithful, to give him 10, give him 10 cities. To be, what the future life holds for us as far as the Lord honoring us and promoting us, uh, it's, it's out of the realm of our imagination. But he will confer honors on those that are faithful to him and put them in positions of responsibility because that's the way that God does things. He could do everything himself, but he delegates to his angels and to us who will be taking the place of the fallen angels. He will be delegating responsibility and privileges and honor. Them that honor me, I will honor. So he is going to make us kings and priests, as it says there in verse 6. To him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. So uh, we're going to close it off here. Uh, and so next time we're going to start on verse 7 on the outline. That's going to be toward the bottom of page 3. And I will uh, make sure we have some other copies of page one and two available. And I really hope we get our internet going and <laughs> these other things. Thank God for the gospel, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much 
for the wonderful, wonderful plan you've put in operation that we as weak, failing, mortal sinners making so many mistakes, yet you receive us. You love us. You're cleansing us. Someday you'll put us to work in your kingdom. You do that now, but you will have even wider responsibilities for us in the life to come. So, Lord, we just want to pledge ourselves to you again and, and uh, pray that the Holy Spirit will be the one in control of our life, control our thoughts and our deeds. In Jesus' name we pray.